Hello and welcome to Everyday Spirituality, the podcast formerly known as Bishop on a Bike. So I'm recording this on September the 13th, 2019, and this is episode number 38. And today we have an interview with Dwight Shiley, who has written an article that's getting some controversial coverage in the internet. Uh, Will the LCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, be around in 30 years? Before we get to that conversation, a couple of things. First off, thank you all for your patience through the summer. I know it's been um, a couple of months since we have had an episode. We are now entering into the fall season, and uh, I've got a whole series of things lined up, um, including what we are going to do is, uh, from time to time, listen to audio portions of the book Everyday Spirituality. A lot of my summer energy and attention went to the launch of this book, um, which came came out uh, the end of August. It's done really well. Interestingly enough, on Amazon, in the Kindle version, it was a number one new release bestseller in the category of Episcopal Christianity. And then the paperback version was number one in the category of Lutheran Christianity. So I don't know what that tells us about uh, denominational use of um, reading devices, but uh, that's kind of the way it worked out. Anyway, um, so we'll going forward, we're going to have some episodes where we'll have recordings of the audiobook. The audiobook, I'm hoping, will come out in October, mid-October, um, finishing up on the last uh, little few chapters and pieces on that. Uh, second thing is um, also really looking for your stories of everyday spirituality. Some of you have sent them to me, and uh, starting in the next episode, um, which will come out um, next week, we will start to read some of those and uh, share some of those stories of people's own uh, everyday spirituality. So that'll be fun. We'll have more of a kind of interactive back and forth with this. If you have one and you'd like to uh, send it to me, probably the best email address to use for that is jim at everydayspiritualitybook.com. And that's also the the name of the website where if you want more information about that book uh, and about the resource guide that goes with it. The last thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of you have asked about the cards that go with that, Everyday Spirituality cards, which are basically, they can be used for journaling, if you are into that, or just general conversation, um, and they're great. Uh, kind of stimulating questions for getting people to talk about uh, and tell stories about their their spiritual stories, in a sense. All right, so that's kind of a little bit of an update. I hope you had a great summer. I had a delightful summer, um, and now into the fall, full on, weather temperatures dropping, uh, but it's great bicycling weather, so that's uh, really wonderful. And I think that'll do it. As always, this uh, podcast is brought to you by the Mission Investment Fund. They help pay for all the back-end stuff. I do this, I give my time and energy to this because I enjoy it, but uh, covering the costs of uh, basically storage and online uh, kind of uh, applications and so forth and so on. They kind of take care of all that, which is really, uh, it's not a lot, but hey, really helpful, and I appreciate it. Jerry Lauro is the Northeast rep, and um, we should probably get him on the podcast sometime and uh, talk with him a little bit. All right, let's get to our conversation with Dwight Shiley, who's a professor at Luther Seminary, and uh, our conversation about uh, will the ELCA be around in 30 years? Well, uh, I want to welcome Dwight Shiley to this Everyday Spirituality podcast, and uh, Dwight and I had an opportunity to meet a couple of years ago in a workshop with some Episcopal bishops and uh, Alan Roxburgh. So, Dwight, it's good to connect with you again. It's great to connect again, Jim. Absolutely. So um, you have written a piece uh, for the Faith Lead uh, blog on uh, at Luther Seminary that's caught a lot of attention, and that's what we want to focus in on. It's called "Will the ELCA Be Gone in 30 Years?" Um, a provocative uh, clickbait title. Um, if there ever was one, certainly gotten the attention of a lot of people. Um, and so before we dive into this article, just, you know, a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do in terms of your work in this area. 
Sure. So, um, so I've uh, taught on the faculty at Luther for 11 years in the area of congregational mission and leadership. And in the last year, uh, I've also um, taken on the role of vice president of innovation as Luther has tried to um, live into a vision of leading faithful innovation for the sake of the gospel in a rapidly changing world, um, we realized that um, we needed to organize ourselves as a seminary in some new ways to particularly connect and equip leaders and churches to address what we think is the core challenge of forming Christian identity and practice in contemporary culture. And so I get to work with a team of faculty and staff and with a lot of church partners um, congregations, synods, um, Episcopal diocese, ecumenical um, church bodies in um, fostering grassroots experimentation and um, learning communities and digital resources and research around how the church can adapt in this um, very challenging and opportune moment that we're in. Yeah, well, and I think uh, you have described the landscape really well. It is it is challenging. It is also opportune uh, times for us. And and the the challenge, you know, that that was really highlighted in your piece. Let's go right to that. Um, the beginning uh, is, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about this projection. You know, where it comes from, how you or the other folks arrived at it, and and what do you know about that? Yes. So, um, so this data um, it comes from a deck of um, slides that um, was created by the Office of Research and Evaluation and was shared with at least two of the seminaries. I don't know if it's been shared beyond that. Um, and we received permission to um, to share it with with our own um, community, with our board, our faculty and staff, and also to make some of it public. And um, the data the there's slides and charts on a, a variety of things. Um, they, it tracks, for instance, the average weekly worship attendance from 1988 to 2017 in the ELCA, which is you know, a drop of about 50%. Um, but then what's um, so striking is the projections out that they've done in terms of a forecast. And I don't know the exact methodology that was used to arrive at that projection, other than that I assume they took seriously the age um, demographics of ELCA membership. Um, so if you look at the aging constituency, the predominant constituency of the ELCA, that accounts for, I think, this precipitous decline. Um, again, these are projections, they're forecasts, and they, there's a whole range. Um, could be much better, could also be worse, right? Um, and so, you know, any projection like this um, always has a great deal of, um, you know, uh, risk of being wrong. And um, um, but I think it it does really call the question on um, some of the realities of where the the demographics and the trends are are headed. So so the worship wor weekly worship attendance projections um, show that by 2041 there will be you know a, about 15,800 um, people in. Um, church across the whole ELCA, which is quite a quite a striking number, and if you look at the membership trends, those are again from um, 1988 to 2017. It's about a third decrease, um, but from 2017 to 2050, they have um, the number going all the way down to 66,540 members across the whole ELCA. And so, so again, this is basically one generation. Um, of um, uh, you know pretty much complete collapse in the in the membership and attendance numbers. Um, also in this data, there are a couple other pieces which um, we didn't I didn't share in the blog piece, but um, I might just mention briefly. Um, they track the um, number of people entering um, new calls and coming out of seminary graduates. Um, and also the number of rostered leaders retiring from Word and Sacrament ministry, um, which right now that, that re number of retirements is about double the number of people entering into ministry, graduating from ELCA seminaries. Um, the, the number of people entering candidacy in the ELCA just in the last seven years has dropped by two-thirds. Mm, yeah, so, well, I know we certainly experienced that uh, every fall and spring as uh, – 
bishops from around the country gather for the whole distribution of, of uh, people who are graduating and assigning them rather and uh, where they're going to go. And the numbers are always, we need uh, 266 and we have 60 available, that kind of a thing. Exactly right. And so there's a, um, a slide in this deck showing just the, the growing gap between um, the supply of pastors available and the churches that can actually afford to pay them, which is right now at about um, a thousand churches that can afford to pay sin and guidelines and cannot find a pastor. So, so there's some really fundamental, we might say, kind of um, breakdown of the system going on in terms of how ministry is structured um, that, that this, this, um, this data from the ELCA, you know, kind of sheds light on for us or, or calls the question on and invites us to some, to some deeper reflections. Yeah, and, and just a, a quick question on uh, how does this compare to other mainline um, denominations and also to maybe other Christian traditions outside the mainline? Yeah, so that's a great question. If you look at the um, the trends um, from you know in, from basically the 1970s, uh, which the mainline denominations all started declining in the mid 1960s, um, evangelical and Pentecostal denominations really exploded in growth starting in the 70s and, and into the 80s. But in the 2000s, that growth started to slow. And what, for instance, was an exponential growth in for instance, Assemblies of God um, membership really started to plateau by 2010. Southern Baptist membership has been in decline. Roman Catholic membership has really only been sustained by new immigrants. Um, and so, so if you look at the other mainline denominations, the, the statistics from what I've seen are, are quite similar to these ELCA statistics. I have not seen in other denominations projections into the future uh, I think there's some courage in doing that. Um, I not, don't know of another denomination that, that's done that, but I would say even in my own tradition of the Episcopal Church, you know, we're starting from a much smaller membership base, and um, the same basic demographic realities pertain in terms of both age and also racial ethnic makeup, which is another serious factor. Sorry. So if you think about America being about 62% white, the ELCA being you know, in the mid-90, 94% white is one statistic I've seen. Um, part of the disconnect for the mainline denominations, which are all overwhelmingly white and, you know, far more than the U.S. population, is um, is simply they, you know, they are not um, connecting with neighbors of color and um, incorporating those communities into their life in ways that reflect the diversification of the U.S. population. So that's another reason why there's that disconnect. Um, there's a book called The End of White Christian America that came out just a couple of years ago that's quite provocative in that it shows generationally the, the cohorts. So if you look at Americans who are 65 and over, about two-thirds are white Christians. If you go down to the millennial age cohort, it's about evenly um, Christians of color and white Christians, um, roughly 26%, 28%. Um, and then, of course, the largest group at a third and growing is the unaffiliated. Um, and so, so generationally, if you just think of that as sort of here's the future coming forward, um, there's a massive shift taking place simply in the generational demographics of American religious affiliation. So we've got a racial component, a generational component, um, combining with uh, some of the things that you and your colleague Michael Binder talk about in terms of some cultural dynamics that are impacting that. Um, I want to come to ideas for what we can do about this in a second, but before we do that, you want to comment on those three ways of naming the root causes? Uh, we've, you've talked about the racial component and the demographic component, but uh, so you want to just highlight those other three things that Pete, you mentioned? Yes. Yeah, so we've been really curious um, here at Luther trying to dig underneath the data on this and say, well, why is this massive generational um, you know, realignment taking place, and, um, and how do we understand it? And, and I would say a, a couple of things on this. Um, one is that 
um, I'm using here the work of Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher whose, whose research on a secular age I think is incredibly powerful for us to understand what's taking place. So Taylor says that you know, starting in the late 1700s all the way up into the, to the mid-1960s, in America there was what he called the age of mobilization, which was Americans um, organizing themselves into all sorts of voluntary societies and clubs and structures and organizations in order to make a difference in the world. And if certainly, of course, our political system is part of this, um, but you think of all the organizations in civil society that, that come out of that era. Now, the denominational um, paradigm of church is very much a product of that age of mobilization. And there are people in our churches, older generations, for whom that's their, way, that's their orientation to the world. Finding identity, meaning, and purpose is through affiliating with and participating in and supporting and serving uh, voluntary organizations. You know, think about all of the clubs and service societies and things like that in our society today. Um, now, what happened starting in the late 1960s was a shift toward what Taylor calls the age of authenticity. And in the age of authenticity, one finds meaning and purpose and identity by looking inward to discover one's true self and express it. And one does that through, you know, endless number of choices of different um, resources, paths, um, options of how to make meaning out of your life. And so institutions that for previous generations really carried that function of community and meaning and purpose um, are, much, are held much more lightly in the age of authenticity. And there's much greater detachment from them. And so we see this for, for instance, millennials, just relationship with um, political parties and with, um, with you know, institutions of all sorts. There's a, there's a greater kind of disconnection and, and detachment and skepticism. Um, and partly that's just because of you know, the sense of how these institutions have actually performed. Um, and and so, so that shift to the age of authenticity, authenticity is a game changer for religious affiliation and participation because people, I think, more and more now understand finding spiritual meaning as an individual quest that the church might serve in some way, but it's pretty optional. So in a secular age, um, it's assumed to be possible to live a perfectly good life without God. And, um, you know, religion, as we know from some of the, the uh, study done in the National Study of Youth and Religion, religion is under, understood by many younger generations in America today as, you know, sort of like a nice cur- extracurricular activity. It can help you make you a nicer person. It can help you make, make you feel better about yourself. But it's, it's pretty optional to live a good life. Yeah. So that yeah. is one factor going on. And then I think alongside that, I think the church is out of practice at actually telling a story that is unique to this culture, right? So I think from in the age of authenticity, churches, many churches are still trying to do age of mobilization activities. They're trying to say, we are a good community service organization, or we are a good social club, or you know, join us and you'll find a family, quote unquote, right? Which is how many congregations describe themselves. But um, but in today's world, there are a lot of other places that serve that need. I'll give you an example. There's a brew pub here in Minneapolis called Surly, which is an enormous brew pub, really popular, full of young people, very diverse, um, packed all the time, and they even have a community service arm where you can show up on a Saturday, do community service, you get a free beer afterward. And some of the couples, the young couples who are doing that, are now getting married. Right? And so, so when you talk to them, you know, this brew pub is serving the purpose that church used to serve for many people in the community. If you want to find you know, community connection and do community service, have a good time, you, well, that's where you look, not to a congregation. So yeah, and, has to, yeah go ahead. The, and I was just going to say, you know, I mean, a conversation I've had with a couple of our pastors, um, including my wife, who serves a pretty healthy congregation. And one of the things she has noticed, particularly in the last five plus years, is that younger folks who come to worship, come to worship, that's what they want, and then they leave. They're not interested in 
you know, minimally hanging around for coffee hour or being involved in something that is community building because their their community needs, their connections with other people are happening in other parts of their lives. They are coming to church worship for that and that piece alone. That's a similar yeah. thing to what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so I so I think that the the social function of church has simply changed in, in many American communities. Again, it, cha- it varies context to context, um, but there is, a, there is a major generational change there. And the church has legitimate, uh, legitimized itself um, on the grounds of the age of mobilization for the large part. I mean, it is said, you know, we are, a, again, there's a certain amount of activism or, or, you know, we're this good community service organization. And, and the problem with that is that those are secular grounds. And the distinct theological story that the church has to offer to the world has been, I think, muted in many ways and it needs to be rediscovered and clarified. Um, so if you were to ask most pastors, give an elevator speech, you know, of two minutes of what your church does in completely lay accessible language to people in the neighborhood who don't have any Christian background, I think many pastors would find that to be challenging because we don't practice it. Um, And so I think part of the work is simply what is our unique, our distinct story and the distinct practices that constitute Christian identity in today's culture. In a previous generation, there was a lot of cultural support for the church that many of that, much of that was simply assumed it can no longer be assumed. We need to practice it. We need to, in this way, I think, go deeper into the tradition and re- recover um, and, and really be able to answer the question, what is the unique good news we have in Christ in language that's accessible to our neighbors, not simply in churchy language, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. so much of what, how we do church is culturally inaccessible to people who are outside the doors. Yeah. So let, I, I want to talk about these six items that go at, so what can we do about this um, that, yes. that you've highlighted? And so maybe we can take a moment to uh, to just touch on each of them, and I can get your comments on them. So the first one is go back to basics. Um, now, I have to tell you, when I first saw that headline, I kind of paused and took a little bit of a I wasn't so sure where you're going with this because a lot of times I hear a go back to basics and I'm, you know, does that mean we need to study the small catechism? Uh, Do we need to have memorization? I mean, so the go back to basics kind of hints at going back to a former way of modeling church and Christian faith life. So, so help me, help me get over that. and, And what are you talking about there in that one? Yeah. So this is language, you know, that's actually surfaced in our work with pastors in and congregations and learning communities over the last several years, where we found as we found that um, many congregations are um, kind of like um, Martha in the, you know, in the Luke 10 story of Martha and Mary, worried and distracted by many things <laughs> and yeah. lots of activities going on. Um, And again, um, in many of those congregations, there are fewer volunteers and fewer resources. So the staff and the the pastors and volunteers that that are there are actually busier trying to sustain these activities, some of which are clearly expressing core Christian practices like, you know, worship, prayer, study, hospitality, etc. But many others of which maybe that the core Christian practice is, is kind of buried in there. It's not so clear, um, you know, how this actually helps people be followers of Jesus or live into a Christian identity in daily life in the world. So going back to basics is really about saying, what are the core things Christians have always done? Um, not necessarily just, you know, memorizing the small catechism, which is a more recent thing in the, in the history, but we're going really far back, um, all the way to the early church and, Throughout Christian history, when the church is vital, um, what do Christians do both personally and together in community that, that help to constitute uh, Christian identity and the power of the Spirit, right? And so, so those, those practices um, are to be, uh, I think, reclaimed, deepened, but made accessible in ways that ordinary Christians can do them in daily life. So just to give you an example, um, 
in, in our, the church that my wife and I serve here in St. Paul, a number of years ago, you know, we realized that we had, as a church had not actually cast a clear vision of the Christian life to our people. We had not actually laid out what are the practices of what Christian, you know, Christians do different from, you know, Zen Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims or secular humanists. So we, we did a process of defining that out of a lot of listening to our people and language that made sense in our, in our context in St. Paul. And, and that was really helpful. And then we realized, you know, a couple years into that, as we worked with those practices and talked about them and tried them on and helped people be equipped around them, that even then it was still involving a lot of translation and, and it was still a stretch for people to make this stuff come alive in their daily life to operationalize it, if you will. So, um, so we tried another experiment of simply what we call pocket practices, which are simple spiritual practices, simple enough to be printed on a business card that mm. we do, we try out, you know, often in church at the end of a sermon or, you know, in a faith form or something, and then give to people and say, okay, take this during the week. And it's, you know, a simple prayer practice, a simple discernment practice, uh, a simple practice around you know, um, connecting with neighbors or taking taking some ver- version of Sabbath. And then we, we invite people to come back and share how that went. Um, but but that is not where I think many congregations are focused, which is much more a lot of energy being spent on it, trying to get people to affiliate and participate with the church and in church programs and activities that don't always necessarily translate into discipleship in daily life. So that's right. what I mean by going back to basics. Yeah, okay, that's really helpful. And in that, too, uh, what I heard in the example that you just gave is less of an expectation that people in the your congregation where you and your wife serve, that people would come back to the church building again, say, on Wednesday night for prayer and meditation. Instead, it was the business card was maybe during the course of your week, on your lunch hour uh, or after school, you might practice some form of prayer or meditation. So it's more on exactly. the, yeah, it's more on the parishioner's timeline, if you will, and the geographic location as opposed to expecting them to come back to the church building for something like that. Exactly. And, you know, that varies context to context, but what I'm hearing from pastors all around is that people just aren't available to come back um, or to participate in activities as often as they used to. And everyone's busy. And so, so really, it's how do we equip people to do it where they are? You know, and yeah. you know, we have a, a young woman in our church who's an ER nurse, and we were asking her, one, you know, with one of these simple practices, which is a be still prayer based on Psalm 46. And how have you tried this out? And she pulled it out of her scrub. She comes actually to our you know, evening service from the hospital, and she said, this is how I get through my shift. <laughs> nice. you know, and so it's, it's that kind of thing that we're experimenting with. And I think that, you know, needs to be experimented with in a lot of contexts. Yeah. So then let's move on to number two. Uh, This one's near and dear to my heart, shift from performative to participatory spirituality. Uh, What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think we've had generations of folks who have been formed to come to church on Sunday and to watch um, professional Christians perform the faith, read the Bible, interpret it for them, pray. Um, we expect, you know, we've, many have expected pastors to be the ones who are, they're going to be the ones reaching out to connect with neighbors and invite them to church or evangelize or lead the way in terms of doing, you know, social justice work and things like that. And, um, and I think the church has formed many of its legacy members with that set of expectations. So one of the fun things we've done in our learning communities is we've asked pastors to name what's expected of them as pastors. And that's usually a really long list, <laughs> as you can imagine. Then we say, okay, what does your church expect of its members? And that's usually a much shorter list. And that list is typically around things like so basically supporting the church, you know, showing up in worship, staffing, you know, volunteering to help with committees and giving to support the budget. But there's often very little in there around discipleship. Like we expect our, our members to know how to read the Bible themselves, or we expect our members to be able to have conversations with God about God with their neighbors, or we expect our members to be able to, you know, to pray um, in, you know, fluently, if you will, in, in ways that, um, that come alive, that help the faith come alive for them. 
or to discern God's leading in daily life in their vocations, you know. And so the shift from uh, from performative to participatory is really about reorienting congregational life around helping every all the whole people of God to practice the faith and in accessible ways, rather than primarily to support a professional caste of Christians doing the faith for people. And, and that's really a revolution. A lot of legacy congregation members never signed up for that and aren't quite honestly, aren't necessarily interested in it. They'd much rather have someone else do that for them. Um, so, so shifting that expectation is really powerful when it takes place and also can be um, challenging because you're renegotiating those expectations. Right. And so that then plays into the, a piece that, uh, that certainly we're dealing with in New England and trying to help people deal with in that is how do you manage and lead change because that's uh, this is a change in, in the whole orientation for how we practice the faith. Then the third one um, is listen, and I've certainly discovered this profoundly in our synod in the last year. The first sentence under this, you say, the church needs to learn how to listen to its own members' spiritual stories and experiences in order to help connect them with the stories of Scripture and the theological tradition. I just published a book uh, that basically was – I was helped by about 200 people from the New England Synod with their own uh, stories of everyday spirituality. So when I read this, I went, oh, yes. Uh, say a little yeah. bit more about listening. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so again, you know, in the performative mo- uh, mode, um, if you look at how congregations spend their time and, and when they're together, there's typically very little space for ordinary members to share their own spiritual stories. So, you know, um, example, my colleague Michael Bender was in Iowa um, with some Episcopalians a couple years ago, and um, he invited them to um, do a very simple practice of spiritual story sharing. And there were these four women who came up to him on a break. They said, you know, we've been in this same church for four decades. We've been best friends. We've known each other so well. And one of them was in tears, and she said, we've never shared the stories we've just shared with each other in the last hour, in all of those, you know, 40 years. Um, another colleague of mine, Andy Root, his, he did a bunch of research interviewing congregation members about their most powerful encounters with God. And they were sto- stories were amazing, you know, really powerful stuff. And all of them said, oh, I'd never share this at church. <laughs> yep. My pastor doesn't even know about this. <laughs> you know, so, so somehow we've structured congregational life in such a way that those conversations – often don't happen, and they don't happen peer-to-peer, they don't happen in community. And so, um, so I th- one of the things that we've been asking um, uh, lead- pastors and, and congregation leaders to, to um, try out is just asking their people what keeps them up at night or asking them, you know, to try out sto- practices like, you know, share a story of a time when you felt most spiritually alive and energized. And um, every my experience of this is that every time I've done this with groups, and I've done it with a lot of groups, there's incredible energy that gets unleashed, incredible connections that get made, and um, people want to do more of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is that, 100%. That is my experience as well. And I could I could go on with my own experiences of, of this uh, whole process where people have these um, encounters with God, and some of them they don't even – think of them as encounters with the divine, but that's essentially what they are. Um, yes. and we have a great opportunity here, and that's a big part of what uh, the, the faith life can do. So we can spend probably a lot of time uh, talking about that, but I want to move on to translate. Most mainline churches' language and cultural forms are inaccessible to most people in their neighborhoods. Um, you want to translate the translate? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you know, so you think back to the Reformation, right? Um, core of the Reformation was with the Bible and the worship of the church being in the language of the people, the vernacular. And I think if um, in many mainline churches today, you know, people coming in off the street who are not familiar with the particular cultural forms and language that we use in worship and in, in church life, we just really find it quite baffling. That was my experience as a new Christian, as a young adult. I was totally puzzled why we were singing 19th century hymns with an organ. It was beautiful music, but I was like, nobody listens to this music in their car, right? You know, and so, um, so one of the things that 
I think the church isn't, needs to do is find ways to do what it's always done, which is translate, right? That's what the incarnation is about. Incarnation is translation. Um, even the New Testament is not written, right, in the language of that Jesus spoke. I mean, it's already been translated, in, if you will, into Greek, right, from Aramaic. From, you know, the faith is it's, it's just integral to the Christian faith for it to come a lot in local languages and cultural forms. And somehow that process has sort of stalled, I think, in many mainline churches. Um, now, if you look at um, many of the megachurches that are, that are growing very quickly, and there's lots of reasons for that, one of the reasons why, in, I think, in many places is that they are far more culturally accessible to people in our communities today than many of our congr- mainline congregations. Now, translating does not mean stripping out tradition and the richness and the beauty of the cultural treasures that we have. We can still keep that and make it new in today's cultural language and forms. And that's just creative work that um, I would love to see the church be more courageous and bold and experimental with. Yeah. I think one of the things that happened in the last hundred or so years is that the so-called fundamentalist traditions embraced the culture when it came to um, style uh, and the mainline folks embraced the culture when it came to things like academic rigor, uh, you know, historical critical uh, form, critical methods of looking at scripture. And, you know, so you've got these two kind of disconnects. And I think earlier you talked about the, Southern Baptists are even decreasing in membership. I think that there's also a there's a cultural disconnect on the more conservative side, even though stylistically they might have been more willing to ad- adapt to the culture, whereas Lutherans, Episcopalians, and so forth have adapted in terms of thinking about its you know religious orientation, biblical understandings, but has been more uh, reticent to adapt to the culture in terms of the style and music and approaches to, to ministry. Um, and that, that, so that's yeah. kind of a fascinating piece that translate folk piece that you have there, I think um, uh, could, could apply in different ways. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. So then number five is experiment. Uh, a couple of years ago, we um, named ourselves as a synod of experimentation. I think we're, reluctantly le- leaning into that <laughs> here in New England. Um, sure. but, uh, but so experimenting and innovation is great and hard. Want to say some things about that? Yeah. So, you know, the fact of the matter is these challenges are adaptive in nature. There's no easy answer to them. We all need to learn and discover new things um, as we go along, which is really what innovation is about. It's really just the the adoption of a new practice in a community and, um, you know, spreading at the grassroots. And that involves a different posture than the kind of performative posture of, you know, the expert is is expected to know the answer ahead of time. This is much more like entering into the world of the Book of Acts where they are more improvisationally discerning God's leading as they try and fail to form Christian community. And one of the texts that um, we make a lot of use of is Acts 16, um, which is the you know, section of the missionary journey where they have this crazy experience of being prevented by the Holy Spirit from going certain places and then this dream of the man from Macedonia and they get to Macedonia and there's no man, it's women, Lydia being the key person that they connect with. And it's just this really wonderful um, adventure of trying and, and failing, if you will, led by the Holy Spirit. And, and that's the kind of posture and practices that I think we need to recover in today's world. So it's just, you know, changes, changing our expectations around success and failure. We can expect a lot of quote-unquote failure, which, you know, things not working before we find something that does work um, and, you know, a tolerance for that. And then learning how to experiment in ways that are inexpensive, so that the failures that are inevitable are not too costly. That's another important piece of it. Um, So I've written a whole book on that called The Agile Church, um, which is really about how do we learn 
um, from some of the most innovative organizations in the world how to go about this innovation, but think about it primarily as a process of spirit-led discernment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the last one is share. Um, we need to take this journey together. Uh, one of the one of the comments, and I'll, I'll kind of let you comment on share, and then this also feedback. Uh, as I posted your article online and a couple of people said, one of the things that seems to be missing from this is an emphasis on relationships. Um, if you don't love the people, why would anybody care? If you don't love the neighborhood, why would anybody care? So forth and so on. Um, and, and so I want to give you a chance to kind of comment on that because I think it might connect here with share. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? And the, the last one of these six uh uh, possibilities for how we can what can we can do about this decline yeah so so I completely agree like all of this work is relational and love is essential in in all of it um, the share piece is just simply noting how isolated so many of our leaders are and so many of our congregations are and quite honestly so many people in today's culture are in today's society there's so much disconnection isolation and loneliness um, we need to pull together in new ways in order to figure this stuff out and be connected together and share what we're learning primarily in a peer-to-peer -peer way. So if you think about how many denominational structures were designed and, and what their purpose was, it's, it's often for, for governance is the basic kind of primary purpose, and that's legitimate. That needs to happen. But they're often not designed to be peer-to-peer -peer learning organizations, which is really what we need in this moment. So this is all, about, I think, about networking. It's about collaborating. It's about creating generative spaces where we can walk together, support one another, encourage one another, and then, you know, as experiments play out in different places, learn from those experiments because so many of the experiments that are happening now are um, not being learned from more broadly. So, mm. you know, the ELCA and other denominations have spent a lot of money and time and energy trying to start new Christian communities and do mission development. Most of the learnings from that have not been shared more broadly with the church. And and so a lot of the, the best experiments have also, you know, they've failed. I mean, they haven't been sustainable, but they're powerful things that have emerged from that. And so we need to find new ways to be connected. At Luther Seminary, we've created uh, our Faith Lead platform for this purpose, as well as our learning community work, in order to connect churches and their leaders together to take this journey and learn with and from one another. And so um, that, I think, needs to play out at a lot of levels. And I think a synod is a wonderful container for that learning. Um, and, you know, so are other kinds of networks that, you know, need to, to be formed. Yeah. Well, and I think you're right. I think a lot of our church leaders are um, feeling a very high degree of isolation. Um, and also, as you mentioned, people just in society. I mean, the American Enterprise Institute uh, has done a lot of research, and Arthur Brooks has spent some time looking at this uh, about, you know, kind of the line from the Eleanor Rigby song, All the Lonely People. Uh, we, we really live in a culture of you know, people are divided up into their own worlds and they're isolated from one another. And certainly there's an opportunity for our congregations to be a, an agent healing in that whole whole piece too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. This is this is really, really helpful and uh you know, when I when I saw what you had written I, I thought, you know, we can spend some time talking about it to unpack this. Um any any last thoughts on you know, people want to take uh, what you've written here and, and dive. You've mentioned a couple of books along the way. Uh, what are what are some other resources or or ideas you have that people could could start to plug into to see what they can do? Yeah, yeah. So thanks for asking. So I'd say a couple of things in terms of more reading. Um, I've published two books in the last few years that really get at some of these questions. The one is the one I mentioned called The Agile Church. The second is one that I co-authored with Craig Van Gelder called Participating in God's Mission. A Theological Mythology for the Church in America. And that's a um, bit heftier book that really tries to delve into these questions of what does it mean for the church to be in mission in today's context um, in the U.S. And, um, and there's a lot of unpacking more of the cultural and, um, and denominational and sort of organizational pieces in, in that book. 
Um, I'd also recommend my colleague Andy Root's books, um, most recent books on faith formation in a secular age and the pastor in a secular age, um, which just came out this summer. Um, the other place I would say is, you know, this Faith Lead platform is um, a resource that we are building, um, faithlead.luthersam.edu, uh, to, to do that purpose of connecting and resourcing. And so we've got a lot of um, blog posts and resources and content up there. We'll be continuing to add to that to um, share experiments, to share stories, and to share um, share connections. Um, we um, we also are hosting a Faithful Innovation Summit now every summer. We did our first one this summer to bring leaders together who are working at these questions from across the church to find a, a space to connect and um, share learnings and all of that. And then finally, um, we have learning communities of both um, congregations and also for pastors that we are running and launching as a way to connect and resource and equip um, folks to, to lean more deeply into this work at the grassroots. Well, great. Those are all really helpful. And I'll put a couple of links in the show notes for people that are listening um, who want to follow up on that. Um, thanks for so much for this uh, conversation about this important topic. Thanks. Take care. Mm-hmm.